The Oberth class was created early into Starfleet's golden era of exploration, the loose unofficial term for a period of time from the late 23rd century to roughly 2360. It was this time that exemplified the Federation mantras of exploration, cooperation and innovation, with the UFP ever expanding outwards in unity, drawing on its myriad of cultures to support it. During this era there were conflicts, of course, but with the Romulans retreating behind the neutral zone and the Kitama Accords managing the Klingon Federation aggressions, the Starfleet was able to focus down on its scientific endeavours and put aside warfare development. Some would go on to see the Federation as complacent during this time, and you can kind of see why. It became standard practice to allow families of officers to live aboard starships, and even entire civilian structures on the later ships of that era. The Oberth was a product of this time. A small science vessel designed for light survey and cartography missions, but with little thought given to defence and even certain detrimental elements to its design. However, it's easy to focus on its shortcomings, but its strengths were the reason the ship design persisted for around a century despite its issues. As mentioned, the design originated in the 2280s. Some say as early as the 50s, although this is unlikely. The Constitution refit had given that vessel a new and final lease on life, the Excelsior was pioneering the new era of deep space exploration as the poster ship of Starfleet, and the Miranda was stepping into the role of patrol and workhorse. There was an opening in the fleet for a dedicated science ship that would be deployed on missions where a full Excelsior or Constitution would be an inefficient use of resources. The Oberth would fulfil this role, and to its credit, its specialisations would serve it well. It was also a fraction of the size of most other Starfleet vessels, and had a far smaller crew complement, but additionally could be operated by only five people. This made the vessel ideal for all sorts of survey missions into known regions, following in the wake of the charted frontiers of those deep space ships that expanded the horizon. It would even see use as a civilian craft, being assigned to other Federation agencies outside of Starfleet for scientific purposes. The first of its line was the USS Oberth NCC-602. The ship was only 120 metres long, 63 wide and 34 tall, across 11 to 13 decks, depending on the level of cargo capacity used in the secondary hull. As mentioned, its crew was usually around that of 80 people, although its maximum appears to be closer to 100. However, the vessel could make use of extensive automation to run with only a crew of five. This is similar to the older ships like the USS Archer that only needed three people to operate. This was perfectly acceptable for the sort of survey missions or studies it was expected to undertake, as it was not to really venture far away from Starfleet territory for long periods. Its sensor systems were incredibly large for a ship of its size, with a large section of the secondary hull dedicated to these systems, while cargo rooms, deflector array and a shuttle bay made up the largest rooms down there. Typically the hangar housed two shuttle pods. Additionally, the secondary hull contained laboratories and other facilities for whatever its mission profile was, including astrometrics, fabrication, hydroponics, or other such specialised rooms. The secondary hull was connected by two pylons to the saucer section, and a turbolift ran down these arms. Unlike most turbolifts, however, these ones were spherical in shape and smaller to fit within this small space. From some official schematics, we can see that there was deck space in these pylons, although I can't imagine much more than storage in this area. Its slanted scale makes it an awkward crawl space. The saucer section contained the bridge, engineering and crew quarters, as well as the impulse drive and warp core. By the end of its lifetime, the Oberth class had a rather nifty core for its size, actually rivalling the Galaxy class in terms of speed, if nowhere near its power levels. 
It was capable of a cruise speed of warp 6 and a maximum of 9.6 for 6 hours, so it could really move. Which is just as well, because its armaments were very light. It had four Type 4 phaser arrays and a single photon torpedo launcher that was more of a probe launcher considering it did not have a high complement of torpedoes, if any. Additionally, its deflector shielding was very advanced, but again not very powerful. This is because the shielding was adaptable and developed to weather and protect this small craft from all sorts of natural hazards that it might encounter, such as gravitational shear and various radiations. It could not deflect major impacts or energy weapons, as well as it simply did not have the power to draw on, but again that was not its purpose. Should the Oberth encounter a interesting collapsing star, then they could get closer and record more than most Federation vessels. However, should they come under attack, well, they were expected to power up their warp core and flee, not engage. Unfortunately, their mission profile and their speed means that they are often close to UFP installations and therefore within summonable range in emergencies, bringing them into conflict against forces like the Borg several times when really they have no business being there, unless they're there to record data. In addition to their shielding, the interior bulkheads were laced with Victurium alloy, which was a powerful insulator again to protect against natural hazards, but this also prevented transporter locks, unless aided by other internal systems. Not great for emergency evacuations. There are also numerous bulkheads all over the vessel that could be vented into space presumably to avoid some form of contamination should something like that be encountered, or to facilitate spacewalks in emergencies. Systems like this, however, do add to the infamy of an Oberth being somewhat of a death trap. Despite these issues, the vessel did perform well in the fields it was supposed to serve in, with it being small enough even for atmospheric flight and its multitude of labs, sensors and scientific equipment allowing it to survey and scan as well as any of Starfleet's larger ships, despite it being a fraction of the size. As time went on, however, the design was only partially updated, with the aforementioned engine improvements and the eventual swapping out of turrets to phaser strips, but technology moved on, and soon the Oberth found itself adopting other duties such as extensive use from the Corps of Engineers to test out new technologies in its labs before being relegated to transport and courier duties due to its decent speeds. Oberth-class ships were still being manufactured in the year 2363 and were still in service by 2381, when the line was being gradually replaced by the more capable Nova-class. The active construction of new Oberths seems to have ended around the time of the Dominion War. The Oberth class is not a tough ship, and numerous unforeseen issues did arise with its design. However, it cannot be denied that for a planetary survey ship, or if a dull sector needed charting, a supernova needed observing, or an irradiated nebula exploring, then the Oberth class is genuinely a good option to send. Problems arise, however, if the Oberth ends up out of its depth and unable to flee, and it really has no place in large scale battles, even in emergencies. Thanks for watching this lore breakdown on the Oberth class. It's unfortunate that about the only times we see them, they're in trouble, but then again, there is not a tale to be told about the many such ships that successfully completed their two month long survey of the Tau Ceti system. But where do you think the majority of Starfleet's maps come from? Someone had to chart them, and they were probably on an Oberth. Until it exploded. I've been Rick, thanks again, and goodbye.